So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Oliver Zamba. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I think there are very, very few events that um, I'm invited to. So <laughs> thank you very much for that. There are also very few events I go to. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here. Obviously, I've been to this university, and so I feel very happy to come back every year. Um, let's take a look at the world. And I think we have people here from Germany. We have many people here from other countries in Europe. As was pointed out, we probably also have a lot of people from other places in the world. If you look at the um, largest internet companies in the world, among the top 10 in the world, you don't find, unfortunately, any internet company from Germany. You also don't find, unfortunately, any internet company from France in the top 10 of the world. You also don't find one from the United Kingdom. You also don't find one from Brazil. You also don't find one from Indonesia. You also don't find one from Russia. And I don't know how many cities we have, but unfortunately you find primarily companies based in the United States and companies based in China. Why is that? And of course there are many reasons. Many people say the ecosystem in the United States is better. Some people say the market in China is better. But if you look at other industries, if you look at the car manufacturers, the chemical companies, not the banks anymore, but basically before Deutsche Bank, at least, there were some really big banks and insurance companies and car manufacturers and chemical companies being in the top 100 of the world in their respective industries. So what is the difference? What does it take to be one day in the top 10, top 20, top 30, or any way to build an internet company of hopefully one day a global scale. So why were we not able to get there? And I think, let's take a humble view. What are we missing? And I think since many of you are founders or want to be founders, I think that's where we have to start. We have to start and ask ourselves, what does it take to be a good founder? And what does it take, basically, what is maybe the difference? And having been in this industry, basically, almost for, yeah, we're getting close to 20 years, basically. In 1995, I was for the first time in Silicon Valley. In 1994, I started to look at this great industry. And um, I basically look at it today and say, the number one thing, before we talk also about other things, the number one thing that is a differentiator between an American founder, a Chinese founder, and a founder from Europe or other parts of the world, is we don't dream big enough. We fundamentally often do not dream big enough. When you meet founders in America, and they explain you the, their vision, they talk about shaping the world, they talk about changing people's behavior, they talk about self-driving cars, flying cars, um, yeah? And many over here, including our entire culture, including even the press, you know, they sometimes laugh about the new ideas from Elon Musk and so on, or they kind of say, this is impossible, and this is difficult, and this is impossible to finance. And I think all of that probably led ourselves, our culture, to be much less risk averse, and it forces us to think smaller. Then you say, okay, that's American salesmanship. But I mean, every single one of the top 10 internet companies in America, we've been invested in Facebook, we've been invested in LinkedIn, we've been invested in many companies in America, and all of those founders have just a very, very, very big dream. I remember one founder telling me, he's asking me, Oli, how do you think, how big do you think my company can be? And I said, what do you mean like in big? Yeah, just 
market cap or people or countries or something. You say, hmm, maybe I thought it was a big number, a billion dollars. And he was just like looking at me. And uh, okay, then I felt it wasn't the right number. So I said five. Uh, so it's five billion. And I thought it was a really big number. Yeah, I remember that was still 10 years ago. And um, then he said, no, 50 billion. And I must say, actually, this founder got to over 50 billion. Yeah, And it shows kind of like, yeah, I get often criticized for many things, but you know, I also seem to dream too little. Yeah, I also have to dream bigger. Yeah, and I think it's something we have to ask ourselves. We have to become a lot more risk friendly, just a lot more. Yeah, otherwise, our entire economy, our entire society will be more digitalized but basically we will lose the edge. And then basically all of us have to go to other countries if we really want to build big companies. And I think still we at this point where I think we can change. And I think whatever you have today in mind of your idea, ask yourself if you're dreaming big enough and maybe we can later bring a few founders up on stage and ask them what is their dream how big do they think they can become this? What's the idea about the market size? How do they gonna want to how do they want to go about it? But there is a real difference in I would say small and medium sized and a huge vision what many of those founders that really got extremely far had. I'll give you a few examples. We have a few people in Europe. There was recently an article and I saw that basically someone, I think uh, it was an investor relations uh, event or something, there was basically a chart and someone had forecasted 20 billion euros revenue for Zalando. That's good, yeah? Not only because I'm a shareholder, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, that's a kind of dream. I mean, the company does three billion. Seven years ago, it did 30,000. Yeah, 30,000, seven years later, three billion. Yeah, a few years later, yeah, maybe 20 billion. Why not? That is only maybe 5% of the fashion market, maybe 3% of the fashion market. Probably by the time they get there, only 2.5% of the fashion market. Yeah, but that is the kind of dreams you need to have. Uh, and I think uh, that's also why the Zalando founders have created fundamentally the largest internet company in all of Europe. That's the only company that's basically more or less worth than more than 10 billion euros. And they dream big and they are still dreaming big. And they were not very much different from yourselves. In 2007, basically they were in, I think Robert and David, I think they were in Mexico. And I think they were working on a startup and we had a conversation. And I think they didn't even have a lot of money, if I remember it correctly. Basically, I paid the flight tickets to come back. Yeah. And, um, and they basically left something in Mexico, which could have become maybe small or medium sized, because they dreamed about doing something really big and had this dream to really change a piece of how people buy, and Americans would say how people change to change the world. And I mean, looking forward, what did they create? A company with over 10,000 people, and um, one of or the largest internet company we have in Europe. So we have examples, and we have to all also ask ourselves, let's start dreaming as of today, a lot, lot bigger. Let's take a second look at America and China. What else do those uh, founders have? And I encourage you to meet as many as you can and to go as many conferences because every time you come back from America and China, you think we are all kind of like um, playing too small. We are playing basically second league and third and fourth league, if at all any league. And um, the second thing they have, they are very, very technology product focused. 
If I look in the last, and we are probably the largest internet investor in Europe, if I look at all the founders we are backing over here, we are probably all very good at business models. But yeah, we can tell you about gross margin, we can tell you about customer acquisition cost versus customer lifetime value. We can tell you, um, we can tell you about uh, how we scale sales forces and, and so on. What's the best customer acquisition channel, how, what, how this and this is in Google Analytics. But very, very, very few of us are product founders, yeah? are people that really work day and night to make their mobile site, their app, their website, their application better. Yeah? If you look at why was Facebook so successful? Because Mark is a very, very product-focused founder. Yeah? If you look at Eventbrite, we early backed also Eventbrite, Kevin Hartz and his wife. They are so product-oriented. Yeah? They think, and that's what drives later customer acquisition costs also low, a great product will just, people will tell about it, yeah, there will be word of mouth. A great product is enough to convince people. Yeah? Instead of buying Google AdWords, they create or put all their money into creating a great product. That's why they pay IT engineers so much money in Silicon Valley, because they believe in product. They fundamentally believe product makes a world. And all those successful, also Salesforce, yeah? Yeah, I think that all those companies basically are so heavily focused and I think that is again something that we should take on. We should embrace. This is not about basically saying we in Europe are bad. It's about embracing things that bring us forward, that make us better founders. And I think when you have a team of founders or one, two or three people in your team, make sure that you think product. I would say also in many of our companies historically, I would say in the last 15 years, it's one of the things we want to change going forward. We want to be much more product founders. And I don't only talk about scalability and so on. I really talk about user interface, conversion flows, and just that the product is by far the best in the market. And maybe the reason is that we have many founders from business schools, myself and others. We have maybe too few founders from engineering schools. Or maybe we don't have the mix of the founders. Business school, engineering school, uh, or law school, engineering school. Maybe that is one of our challenges. That Stanford has engineering school guys plus the MBA guys getting together. Or Harvard plus MIT engineering or something. But I, again, let's not continue to be those business model founders, but we need to be product founders to win this race. So that people on Instagram, on YouTube, on WhatsApp talk about our products and not kind of like being falling there behind. And third, the team. Yeah, the team is something that, again, many of them, if you look at, um, Alibaba, as probably the only company in the world, we have already uh, had a very successful partnership with Alibaba in Southeast Asia. Yeah, we built a company and Alibaba is now the majority owner of that company. And it only took us four years to build this company in Southeast Asia. And uh, Alibaba invested almost uh, half a billion dollars at a $1.5 billion valuation. And when you look at the team of Alibaba, yeah, the founding team, Mark, who I only met once, but Joe Tsai, number two, basically, they are so impressive. And you realize, often here you have a founding team of two, three, four, and there's maybe one or two, maybe 50% of the founding team impressive, but the other two you seem to have come more out of friendship, out of luck into that team. I think... Again, comparing the most successful companies, they had an amazing team. The Google founders plus Eric Schmidt, yeah? Mark plus Cheryl from, uh, at Facebook. Yeah? And look at Zalander, Robert, David, and then 
they didn't look for someone who were not as good as them, but they looked for someone to be at least as good as them, another uh, person called Ruben. And that was after, I think, two years or one and a half years, Ruben joined. And he was at least as good as Robert and David. And I think that's again, the company only got so far because the team was great and they continued to hire amazing team. If you look at what most people admire and what made a huge difference to people like Zalando was, they have probably 30, 40 top people, each of them could be a founder. And I think I've seen very few companies that are so focused. And I can tell you, an American investor, when he comes to your board meeting, he doesn't start, give me the KPIs, give me the financials. He starts, I want to see who you hired. Show me the CV, get the person in. Is he really, really good? Yeah? And then he gets them in and he gets the feeling, what has he done before? Why is he really good? Yeah? So much focused on putting the right team because let's be honest, you cannot build the entire company yourself. Yeah? If you assemble, yeah, it's like those soccer teams and so on. You're the trainer, you have to assemble the best teams. Yeah? Give them the glory. Let them be in the newspaper, but assemble the best teams. And that's what basically the best founders have been able to do. Mark realized, you know, let's have Cheryl, let's have someone for business, let's have someone for organization. And he assembled amazing teams so that basically was able to build this company. The American view of a founder is, he's the one first and foremost responsible to build an executive team. We come often from the German version, kind of like the founder is the one basically who has to work most and basically has to deliver most and has to basically be in everything in every detail. I think the combination is the best. Of course you should be a detailed founder. But the best founders assemble an amazing team. They look all the time for making their team better. And not like a pyramid. Smart and then smartness goes down. No. Yeah? But really broad. Hiring people that are smarter than yourself. And that's not easy. Yeah? It's not easy. And I think that needs to be much more in our mindset. Yeah? We need to be, we need to love product. We need to love to have the best mobile site, to be mobile application, to be ahead of that, to be top in the app store, to look at our NPS or net promoter score, to look at our reviews on I, on in the I, in the, I, in, the, uh, I, uh, in the app store, etc. Yeah? And to do all of that, we need to have a team that is unique. And I think, let's basically, since we have 20 minutes and we also want to reserve a lot of time for any kind of question or comment or areas you want us to dive in later, let's basically choose yeah, a few, uh, now it gets a little tricky because now it's about you. Basically, um, let's choose a couple of founders and let's hear maybe if they're open about their dreams if not, basically, let's ask them a few questions so we figure out if they are founders that we feel they're already ready to build something big or kind of like what, um, what we feel about their ideas. So how many of you already have an idea? Okay, now it got, I should have asked that in the beginning without, yeah? So now it only got a very few. So you raised your hand, no? Yes. Okay, can you come on stage? Sure. So, then there was a little bit over here. You come on stage, and then something in the back. So where do you have no founders in the back? Come on. There's one. I can't see you, but maybe you come down. You just raised your hand. Yeah? So we have three founders here. Where are you from? I'm from Silicon Valley, California. Oh, now you have them already, yeah? <laughs> you see already the difference, yeah? Yeah? yeah. And you? I'm from Afghanistan. Okay. So we have Silicon Hi. Valley, Afghanistan, you? Hi. Oh. Uh, Germany, Düsseldorf. Oh, we have one Germany here. Okay, so one founder from Germany. So I think, yeah, we have fundamentally Asia, United States, and Europe here represented. Um, okay, let's start with Silicon Valley. Yeah? So maybe you tell us, like, but you have only, we don't have that much time. You see it, yeah? We give you 30 seconds to tell about yourself. 
and then another 30 seconds about your idea. All right. So I've worked for the last five years in San Francisco, California for platform companies in the mobile advertising space. I'm now an MBA student at Vaho in Dusseldorf. And I'm basically really uh, passionate about products and mobile technology. My um, company is designed to uh, automate drone flight and robotics to collect data on farms and commercial sites. And what we want to do is gather the data and really interpret it in a nice, easy to understand way where we can deliver it to farmers or people you know, on the construction and, and use it to improve their costs, uh, execute better on the work that they're doing and, and things as such. So basically take data, make it really digestible, understandable, and automate the collection through drones and robots. I mean, you already saw the difference, yeah? He's passionate about product, yeah? <laughs> like, can you, can you see ourselves explain to a German VC and so on, uh, ich bin leidenschaftlich über das, für das Produkt, yeah? They would probably laugh at us, yeah? yeah? But that's how, yeah, that's the way we need to become, yeah? We need to become passionate about our product, yeah? We need to use kind of the terms platform companies, data digestion, yeah? <laughs> yeah? They, they do it so much better in America, <laughs> yeah? So much better. Okay. But uh, in all fairness, I am studying at a German university in Dusseldorf at the WHO, so I also believe there's a lot to learn from the German community. Detail. <laughs> okay. So, Imal, maybe you tell us about, uh, again, only 30 seconds. No, you came, you get 45 because you came a long way. No, yeah? I, so, <laughs> yeah, so 45 seconds for okay. yourself. Thanks. And then another 30 seconds for the yeah. idea. Be besides the fact that Afghanistan comes on the first because of the alphabetical sort of thing, we also get some um, uh, contributions like that, 15 seconds extra. So, um, I started my first company um, in 2008. It was a software company. And it was successful in Afghanistan. After that, I did three other startups, which I failed so badly, uh, especially one when we were trying to kick out uh, QuickBooks from Afghanistan, and that I lost a lot of money. But short story long, or long story short, put it as you want, uh, we did a lot of web applications in Afghanistan. For example, the birth certificate and death certificate being one on the top, the income tax reporting system being the second. So then I came to Germany on a scholarship. I started a company called Help Me. And I just dreamed a big dream when you were on the stage. And I signed my own card for my future. My domain is helpme.com.de. And my dream is to drop.d. Because helpme.com would cost over half a million dollars. That's my big dream. Okay. And, and this platform is a, an IT support platform. I want this help me button on everyone's computer so that when you guys have a problem with your computer, you press help me button instantly and IT soon get connected with you with voice chat, text chat, screen sharing, you, uh, you get the problem solved by the IT guy. All in the browser, no software to download, no TeamViewer, no Skype. And there will be millions of IT students on the platform. That's my big dream. So I think already for someone to come from Afghanistan to the Idea Lab, yeah, I think that's already someone who's dreaming big. Yeah, that would mean to put that in perspective. It would either be from all the Germans here at Idea Lab to go to China, or probably to go to Mars. Yeah, so I think basically, I think that is someone that we probably definitely buy into his passion on his idea. I think it takes more due diligence. Yeah, remember we're Germans. Yeah, but I think. You see basically in our friend from California and our friend from Afghanistan, those are people that are passionate about dreaming big. So what about the Germans? Well, um, I don't look German, but I am German, so yeah, it doesn't matter. But my parents came, uh, well, uh, 25 years ago to Germany and, um, yeah, to Freiburg, very nice city. And then I moved for my study to Düsseldorf. I studied business, as most of you guys. And for uh, about two years ago, I found it with my brother, like you found it with your brothers. Um, this company, um, can you see it? 
äh, richtig gut bewerben.de. It's a German name because um, yeah, we, we operate in the Dach market in, in, in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. And now we became the uh, leading job application platform. So you can book job applications in different languages on our platform. So that's what we do. And uh, you asked about uh, dreams and well, my dream is like honestly to be introduced one day like you were introduced on a stage. So this would be very nice. So we want to... <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why you were introduced like you were introduced is because you founded uh, very large internet companies. And well, the job market is very large too. So we are now the leading company for job applications, if you want to book that. And we want to become bigger, uh, not only in Germany, but also in other countries. So that's it, yeah. Okay. I think, tell us about in your team with your brother. How good is your mobile app, your website? Who's the product guy? Are you the marketing guy because you're the best looking among your <laughs> brothers? Or is it, <laughs> are you the product guy? You haven't seen my brother. He's also good looking. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, well, I'm um, the business guy. I studied business and my brother studied IT. And so he's the um, CTO. He knows, he's like, what are you doing? I won't put that button there because it it's against, I don't know, user experience. Uh, uh, and he's the product guy, yeah. That, that's what you need, yeah? Yeah, a brother, the product guy, yeah? And uh, the little brother being the business guy. You're the little brother? Uh, I'm the, y you see, I'm huge, so. <laughs> uh, no, uh, he's uh, 20, 23, I'm 27, so. Okay. So, I think, I mean, we took those founders randomly. Yeah, I think, as you can see with all of them, I think they are passionate about the idea. I think they have a big dream. Can it maybe be even bigger? You sleep over it tonight? Here, I don't think we have a problem. This is America. <laughs> yeah. And here, I think he's uh, basically, he already came a long way. And I think uh, basically what I can only share is, I think there are, there's space to build big companies everywhere. We've not operated in Afghanistan yet, but we've come close with Pakistan. We've come close with Myanmar, obviously also India, Russia. Yeah? So we're coming closer and closer. Oh but uh, fundamentally, I think there are, All of those markets, what you told me about digitalizing um, business processes or government processes, I think is uh, definitely a market that should ex exist everywhere. And once you've got Afghanistan, there are many more markets to get, or you own all of applications in Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, I'm doing my master's here in Germany, in Koblenz City, so I am in Germany now. <laughs> okay, so you're going to basically compete with us? Uh, no, actually, I will build the future with you together. So That's the way to go. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? You see? So, I think, please, tonight, yeah, and we have now another eight or nine minutes uh, left, basically, sleep tonight and ask yourself the idea on which you're working, the team that you have assembled, is that a Facebook team? Is it a Robert David Rubin Zalando team? Is the idea a booking.com price line idea? Yeah. Is the market big enough? Yeah. I had in 1998, I met this founder in um, Boston. And he explained me something very simple. Again, an American founder. And he said, Oli, if you built one pizzeria, you have to own, you have to work 18 hours to be successful one pizza place. If you build Pizza Hut, you still only work 18 hours. You still work 18 hours or 16 hours. Yeah? I don't think there are many people who work in small businesses as long hours as they, if they had built a big company. And so I think our way is definitely Big market, product focused, and the most amazing team. Thank you very much, guys. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure.
So it's your conference. So instead of kind of like sharing what I think is important, basically sharing the topics that I think are important, let's hear what you would like to have covered. Maybe questions um, to me where you want to have an insight or a thought, basically maybe to others here in the group. So what are topics that you would like to cover? What are questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's a good question. What I said about the ecosystem means that we need not only founders that dream big, but we also need investors who take risks and investors who share the dream to build big. I think there are new generations of uh, investors. I would say in 1998, when we raised our first money, it was limited, but even then I think we met among the 20 investors that we saw, one group of investors that basically were willing to back, yeah, and there was not a lot we had at that point of time. So it was maybe a small dream in perspective to today, but it was probably a bigger dream than most other people at that point had, had dreamt in the internet in Germany at that point of time. So I think there are a small set of investors. We just raised a big fund because we have big dreams. We raised the biggest internet fund in Europe um, with more or less a billion dollar in firepower. And um, because we felt to build big companies, we need a lot of capital. We cannot be only a $120 million fund, a $200 million fund, a four or $500 million fund, we think one of the key problems in Europe is that the funds are too small to dream big. Because if you look at it, if you have a great team, a great product-focused fo founding team, and a big dream, then you will not win if you don't have a lot of capital. And um, to build the Zalando needed hundreds of millions of dollars, but the outcome is a company that one day might do 20 billion euros. And so I think that is very key. So look for, found, for, look for teams. I think they are there, maybe 5 to 10% of all investors out there. I think often you find them in people who have built businesses themselves. And I think if you have an idea, we are now in the last, I would say, 12 months, we invest in over 30 companies in Germany, in United Kingdom, in many markets of the world. And I think we are very open. I think there are also others that want to back you. Other questions? When you hire your founding teams, you put them together and you want to make sure that you hire the best people. Um, do you have some tips and tricks for like questions that you ask them, um, some, some certain questions that you always ask to make sure that you are hiring really the best people, that they are not just bullshitting, that they are really going to be really good? So one of the questions I do, I basically ask them, not for references, but I ask them to give me their own view. So basically, let's say you're a founder and you made an internship. Yeah, during your whole life, you probably worked somewhere. And I said, OK, at this company, if I talk to your, the guy basically leading your department there, what would he say about you? And then basically people start to think, oh, what would someone else say about me? Would he say basically, I worked hard? Would you say, basically, I really had an impact? And um, so there are kind of a number of questions where basically I try to figure out is, is that someone basically who, who's persistent, who's working hard, who's basically good at adapting? I mean, if you look at a founding team, either you have, like he with his brother, a perfect complementary partnership, or basically you have founders that are a little bit more the same, or basically you need a founder who can adapt, who basically can say, okay, I might not be the most product focused, but I can hire a CTO, yeah? I can convince the CTO, basically I can dive myself, I can force myself deep enough into the product to hire amazing people. And I think that's what you try to figure out. And I would say 
there's one thing, yeah? Just go out and meet and meet and meet. Yeah, and that's why those places here, this idea lab is great. Meet as many, figure out what are other founders. And don't just like stay in your, okay, I came from this school or from this university and those are the three best we are, but I think there are many, many teams in Silicon Valley and in, in other parts of the world now where someone from the East and West Coast and they just got to know each other through a friend and they are basically a great team. So I would just, if you ask me, I would probably always go more for the quality of the team, even if you don't know that person for so long. Yeah, so if you want basically rather complementarity than knowing someone for a long time. Other questions? Uh, I'm wondering about your personal, um, your personal opinion. You said that dreaming big is important and sometimes dreams go bust. And uh, in the United States, you have that culture of um, investors where they say, great, you failed, you burned other people's money, what did you learn from that? And um, you always hear in Germany that it's more like um, if something, if your first startup goes bust, you're basically burned. So would you personally invest in somebody who burned either your money or uh, other people's money? And do you think there is a shift needed for... Um, uh, for Germany to be successful. I love most people who burned money with someone else. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, that's perfect. Yeah? It's basically, yeah, let someone else pay for kindergarten. Yeah? That's great. No, I think, let's be honest here. I think anyone who had his first six, nine, twelve, eighteen, twenty-four months of internet experience, real life, having started in, uh, in, in Afghanistan, this, I don't know, QuickBooks copy or QuickBooks attack and it didn't work and so on, um, having done any other company that failed, is perfect. It's perfect because you can say the following, she or he knew, basically knows now how hard it is, what to look for in people, what didn't work, what invested didn't work, what market, how difficult it is to convince big corporates, enterprise, or how easy or whatever difficult it is, SMEs, how whatever kind of they cannot just go with Google and Facebook paid ads, but need to do social, how to get influencers. So I think it's perfect. If you look at our um, companies historically, we had a very successful company, uh, City Deal, uh, that was similar to Groupon. And basically that business we, when we built it, we took almost, I think, three quarters of the founders were all people who had a business before, basically. Yeah? And we had failed with them before. Yeah? I mean, we are backing in, uh, young people who come with us with their ideas, yeah? investing in them. We are basically looking for teams with our ideas. So for me, I think someone who has done it 6, 12, 24 months. Of course, there are also founders who have to ask themselves and say, I'm not the person to be a founder again. Yeah, but I would say that is less than 10%. Most of the founders that we meet, they are ready to get up again. Yeah? They really get willing to get up again from the beginning, from scratch. And I think I perfectly share with you that is something that we need to accept about our company, for example. I tell you, when we sold, or when we had this capital increase, when we sold 50% of our shares, when we sold 50% of our shares, at the several multiple times making our money, at double digit returns of whatever, a rough 80, 90% of our money, IRR, we got one mentioning in many newspapers. But we get, for every failure that we make, as many, yeah, for one startup where we lose 500,000 or 1 million, we get often in Germany as many press articles as selling a company of $1.5 billion to Alibaba. Yeah, so there you see it, what sometimes what anti-failure culture we have, but as a founder, you just don't care. Let the others care for that. Let the others read the news. You just already work on your next company. Yeah? 
I think don't focus on what other people say. Ah, he failed. I'm now at uh, this great uh, big uh, German corporation, but my friend from school nine months ago, he left. Oh, he failed. Ah, did you hear that? He failed. Ah, he failed. Ah, did you hear it? He failed. He failed. He failed. He failed. He failed. He failed. Yeah? All the time. It goes very fast. Failure spreads faster than success. Yeah, in Germany. Yeah? In, um, but you need many failures. Either your company fails, or your marketing strategy fails, or other things fail. Yeah? And every time you need to get up and turn it around. And I think we are in the business of failing. And the logic is quite easy. We make 10 companies and we put 1 million each. But because we believe if one of them makes it, we will make 100. That's the same logic as Jeff Bezos. Yeah? He had a conference and he explained the same logic. That's why he's all the time trying. You only know about Prime that works. He built handsets that didn't work. He tried to do into booking.com that didn't work. Yeah? The great companies, the great founders and the great companies try and try all the time. And they don't care what people talk about them. They don't care what people write about them. They just get up all the time because one day they will get it right. I think one more question and then I think we have to go. So, it's a good question. What can we bring to the table? So, I think no one else in our parts of the world, again, in Silicon Valley and so on might be different, I think has access to many, so many great founders. So, if you want to start something in e-commerce, we can connect you with Robert from Zalando, with Dominic from HelloFresh, with Philip, Philip from Home24, you tell me you want to go to Asia with Max from Lazada, you want to go to Africa with Sasha to Africa, we employ 8,000 people in Latin America, so we have enough people everywhere. Second, no one else has helped his company to raise more money in Europe than our team. You want to have an intro to Temasek, the Southern Wealth Fund from, um, from Singapore, you want to have Tesco to invest in your business. You want to have an intro and meeting with the CEO of Walmart in Bentonville, a very exciting town. Basically, you have, want to basically um, have a high level intro to the investment banks, yeah, whatever. Investors, corporate customers, you want to discuss kind of with the big insurance companies, your new ideas. I think we have a very, very unique, a very high level um, network of contacts here. And then about your ideas, I think we have seen many, many ideas. I think we have a team of over 25 people who only research ideas every single day. We probably meet on average, I don't know, 30, 40 companies a day. And uh, that basically builds over 20 years a lot of knowledge about your idea that we can contribute. Sometimes you might say, this idea we just do not believe in. And I think then you basically sleep over at night and either next day you think, no, my idea is right, so I will continue. Or you say, maybe there was an element that I have not considered yet, let me think about that. So I think people, investors, idea, and then, of course, we have global framework agreements with Google, with Salesforce, with Salesforce.com, with Amazon Web Services that give you unique terms and conditions that as a small startup you would never have. And that basically the moment you sign, basically we invest, we give you access to, and then you can take advantage of those favorable commercial agreements. And then, of course, we have functional experts, be it on online marketing. We employ in Berlin roughly 300 people and their only job is to support our companies. So, summing up, we believe in you. I think the three people we had on stage, and they were random, I'd never met anyone before, I couldn't even see where they were sitting, couldn't even see anything. So basically, those three was probably a representative, um, a good representation of the audience here today, or the, the, not the audience, the active members of this conference. And I think 
this, having seen the three makes me very feel very confident that uh, hopefully many of you will make it to the largest internet companies in the world. Thank you very much.